it's a real privilege to be able to present and share with you some of our work today. Um, and I hope that uh, some of the approaches, I'm sure, are ones that, that we're, we're sharing, and there may be some things that we're doing in the human context that are, that are helpful and informative more broadly ac across animal, animal genetics. So um, these are the, the three broad areas I was hoping to, to cover today. Um, and I was going to start by um, explaining how we've really been leveraging uh, understanding of human genetic variation in terms of its impact on the, on the immune response um, using approaches such as expression quantitative trait mapping. And I'll then show you how we're starting to think about this in the context of when our response to infection goes wrong in the small minority of people, and that can lead to conditions such as sepsis. And then finally, I wanted to share with you some unpublished work where we're trying to bring everything together in terms of our ability to annotate these regulatory variants, understand the genes they're modulating, and then take that forward in terms of understanding how they could actually help us prioritize and identify potential drug targets. So the immune system is, is clearly hugely complex, and we're still understanding new, new cell types and function and pathways. But I think it's fair to say that in the human context, um, what, what is sometimes described as experiments of nature, whereby highly penetrant mutations lead to very severe and um, profound disease phenotypes through immune, primary immunodeficiencies, has really taught us a lot about the function of, of, of particular molecules in this system. What is perhaps less recognized is, is the impact of common genetic variation, where we're really talking about uh, a predominance of non-coding variants, which are having a much more subtle effect. So they're modulating, for example, expression of a particular gene. And rather than leading to complete gain or loss of function, we're adjusting the thermostat. And this has consequences clearly, as we believe that this underlies a lot of the associations with autoimmune disease, for example. But in a healthy population, I think it's also clear that these, these regulatory variants mean that within the room here, each of us will respond a little bit differently um, when we're challenged, for example, with a particular microorganism. And in most cases, that won't have any effect, but there is a spectrum. And these more common variants, I think, can also teach us a lot about immune function as well as these more profound um, primary immunodeficiency driving variants. So when people have done genome-wide association studies, uh, no matter what the trait, um, the, pre the predominance of the, of the variants that are turning up are likely to be involving uh, non-coding regulatory, uh, regulatory DNA sequences. And there's significant enrichment when we look at annotated enhancers for these types of variants. But the challenge comes when we think about the complexity of gene regulation. And there are increasing number of exemplars, such as the FTO locus in the, co in the context of uh, obesity, whereby variants which may lie indeed, in this case, within the intron of a gene, are highly complex in terms of how they're acting. And because of the three-dimensional structure of the genome and the fact that DNA looping is happening, actually the consequence of that genetic variation may be at a considerable distance. In this case, part of the explanation appears to involve homeoboxed um, genes. And with the single base change here in this lead-associated variant, we're losing um, a transcriptional repressor, uh, which results in expression of the gene in an allele-specific way. So in other words, we cannot simply rely on the nearest gene as um, with certainty being the one that is likely to be modulated and underline the association. And really, if we're going to leverage the power of these type of genetic association studies, we really do need to understand the specific modulated gene, the pathways and the functional mechanism um, in order to take that forward in the context of either understanding disease pathogenesis or potential drug targets. So I'll show you some data now where we've tried to use one approach for linking um, particular variants to two different genes based on the idea of expression quantitative trait mapping. So what we're doing here is measuring gene expression in several hundred individuals and associating that with the possession of particular genetic variants. 
And what I think is becoming clear through um, the work of, of many in this field is that actually we need many fewer individuals to have good statistical confidence in these association, associations. So certainly for local associations or cis, cis EQTL, in other words, genetic variants in the locality of a particular gene rather than um, showing association across the whole genome where we're looking for trans associations, hundreds of individuals are, are probably sufficiently powered. To look for those trans associations, I think we do need thousands of individuals and we're currently underpowered as a field for doing that. But as an intermediate phenotype, there is a lot less noise, if you like, than if we were to look at a phenotype which was manifest in terms of the body system and a particular disease trait. So in some early work that we did, and I'd like to really highlight the, the key role of Ben Fairfax in this work, we recruited healthy people and purified um, peripheral blood uh, monocytes and B cells in this particular example. And we assayed gene expression using the technology at the time, which was based on microarrays. We did extensive genotyping and we looked for association. And what, sorry, what we found was that there were indeed many associations um, involving thousands of genes. But when we started to compare across the cell types, what, what we found was that a significant proportion, in this case comparing these two different uh, cell populations, at least a third are occurring in a cell type specific manner. So in other words, you need to think about the relevant cell type in the case of GWAS for the particular trait you're interested in, otherwise you may miss the association. This can be seen in quite an extreme situation, such as this example involving L-selectin. So what we're showing here are levels of gene expression, and this is on a log two scale, and we're finding that the C allele is associated with higher expression in the B cells, but lower expression in the monocytes. So this is the same SNP. So this is a directional EQTL, an extreme version of that cell type specificity. And of course, if you were to look in a mixed cell population, and this is qPCR data now for these two different cell types, but also for peripheral blood mononuclear cells, in the PBMCs, you find no difference um, based on allele. So there's the potential to be potentially confounded. And these directional EQTL are relatively rare, but with a high degree of statistical confidence, in this case, we were finding them in over 30 genes. And this is a relatively um, modest study that we're looking at here. We've gone on to look at a number of different cell populations, as have others in the field. And I just wanted to briefly show you some data uh, for neutrophils. So neutrophils are a hard cell type to work with, um, but we were able to purify these um, with good levels of cell viability and find evidence of local associations involving over 3,000 genes of which a significant proportion are not observed in other cell types. And when you start to overlay these expression-associated variants with the variants that have been associated with disease, in this case with autoimmunity, allergy, and the response to infection, you start to see significant enrichment. So this is one example involving a gene uh, PADI4, which is important in post-translational citrullation of histones, and in important process of pathogenesis in the, of rheumatoid arthritis. So this is a GWAS hit, and we found evidence again of one of these directional EQTL. So in other words, we're seeing a different association in our neutrophils, in this case compared to our monocytes. And I think the EQTL are just one part of the toolkit that we should be using here. And another important consideration is actually the the functional genomic landscape within which these variants are occurring. So in other words, the pattern of chromatin accessibility or of histone modifications that might be marking potential enhancers. So in this case, for example, we've got histone H3K27 acetylation and H3K4 um, ME1, and we can see how these patterns start to differ between our cell types. I mean, when we co-localize this with our expression-associated variant that's also our GWAS variant, we can start to hypothesize about how there might be a mechanism involving these epigenetic differences. So 
we need to start to build up knowledge of the epigenetic landscape within which genetic variation is occurring, build up knowledge of association with gene expression. And I'll show you later in the talk how we can also build up knowledge of the physical interaction that might be occurring between a particular region and um, a given gene. This is just to highlight that there are now many, many papers that are available and lots of publicly accessible data for different cell populations and initiatives such as GTEC, which are profiling across many different tissues across the body, many of which are inaccessible in living individuals, are really a powerful resource which allows us to, to use our genetic associations hopefully in a meaningful way. What there are less data sets currently of, rather than simply thinking about our cells in a resting state, actually thinking about them in a disease-relevant context. So you could say, ideally, let's try and get the cells from the patients and really understand what's different in terms of those genetic associations with gene expression in our patients versus our healthy individuals. But one step along the road to that, which in some senses is a simpler system, is to induce them. So in this case, I'm going to show you data where we take our purified monocytes and we stimulate them with lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin, which you'd find in, in the wall of bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, and also with gamma interferon. And then the, the other spin that we had in this data was to consider not just one time point, but, but a later time point in terms of that LPS response. So um, this is data I'm showing you now where we had information on all of these different time points and conditions. So it's a reduced set of 228 healthy volunteers. And perhaps as you'd expect from that data that I'd shown you in terms of cell type, about half of the associations with gene expression were not present in our resting monocytes. You only saw them if they'd been activated, in this case, with LPS or gamma interferon. So this is showing you the data. Each line here is representing a probe that's interrogating a different gene. A significant proportion of the EQTR are indeed shared across from our naive to our induced monocytes in the different conditions, but a significant proportion are very specific to that particular context. So if we were to think about everyone in this room in terms of their expression of lymphotoxin alpha, an important early cytokine, in the resting state, things are pretty tight. Each of these is a different individual, remember, and we're seeing not, uh, not very much variation, essentially. But once we've stimulated the cells with LPS for two hours, there's a very broad range in terms of our responsiveness as healthy people to that challenge. And then that level of expression is dropped right back down at 24 hours. So when you look at, at lymphotoxin alpha in the resting state, there's no evidence of an EQTL. It's only after that induction with LPS for two hours that we see the EQTL highly significant, a p-value of um, to the power of minus 41, that's then dropped back down at 24 hours. And this gets interesting when we think now about these distant associations. So I've talked about cis-EQTL, so these are local associations where we've only considered SNPs in the region of a particular gene. So we've taken a window and that has reduced our burden of multiple testing. But if we consider SNPs that are more distant, indeed may be present on a completely different chromosome, and look for association with expression of a particular gene, we need much higher statistical confidence, but we can find these trans associations. So this is a local EQTL for interferon beta. Again, it's one of these examples that you only see after you've induced the cells um, with stimulation for two hours and it's dropped back down at 24 hours. But if you take that same SNP and, and look for association across the genome, actually there's a whole series of genes, and these are located on different chromosomes on this CIRCOS plot, whose expression is associated with that same SNP. So that's interesting. What, what, what does it mean? And you could say, well, let's think about the pathway that's involved downstream of interferon beta. And actually, it lines up almost perfectly with that pathway. So in other words, the differential expression of these interferon response factors, etc., cetera, is, is all falling under our JAK-STAT signaling from interferon beta. So it's a profound consequence that might arise from a point mutation 
in that upstream gene in terms of the physiological consequence. So a small change could be very important. And you only find this association if you've got that later time point. So there are a number of these, these uh, trans-EQTL that we've observed, and this is another example. And as you can see, there are many hundreds of different uh, genes that are showing association in trans with this particular SNP. And this is an example, rather than of a pathway, of a transcription factor gene. So we've got a local association with the expression of that transcription factor gene. So then in this case, you could say, well, it's likely that the, these genes might be targets of that transcription factor. So the sort of experiment that could be helpful here is to do um, a chromatin immu immunoprecipitation or CHIP-seq experiment whereby we can identify all of those, hopefully, sites where the transcription factor is binding. So that data wasn't available for, for interferon response factor 2 or IRF2. So we did the CHIP-seq experiment, identified the sites of binding, took a window around those sites and found very significant enrichment for our genetic association that I've shown you here in terms of this EQTL data. There's the potential for discovering novelty here, and I think that our genetic information can back up the data that we might get from ChIP-seq, for example, to really say what are the likely targets of this transcription factor. So again, we're using experiments of nature that we've got in our population, in this case a human population, but it would apply equally in terms of other, other, other organisms. And at the time, we took the available uh, GWAS catalog um, that's accessible through NHGRI, and we said, what's the overlap in terms of our uh, expression-associated variants with those from the disease catalog? And you can see here uh, the relative enrichment for different categories that we've, we've grouped that data into. And in this case, we've got highly significant enrichment, for example, in terms of bacterial infection, but more broadly in terms of immunity and inflammation, with about half of these EQTL um, overlaps only when we look in the induced state. So I think what we need is more and more of this kind of data to have increasing confidence across different uh, disease-relevant contexts, and hopefully it will guide us in terms of how we can use that GWAS data. But EQTL, as I say, are only one part of the toolkit that we need to use to address this, this kind of problem. So I'll just show you a couple of examples now um, where if we think in this case about a genetic association with inflammatory bowel disease and the gene CARD9, we can start to build up an allelic series. So this is something that people think about more in terms of gain and loss of function variants in, with Mendelian traits. But essentially, we've got a surrogate for function based on gene expression. And our EQTL can provide that when we start to align it with disease risk. So this is our um, plot from the GWAS data, uh, each of these being different SNPs. And we've got a level of significance. And we can see there's a peak association here. Um, and in this case, the lead SNP is also the lead EQTL for CARD9. So this is present constitutively in human monocytes and indeed in other cell types, and gives us increasing confidence that CARD9 might be the driver of that association. Because we've got these other conditions of activation, we can start to see whether there are other, other associations. And actually what we found when we looked in our interferon-stimulated monocytes was that there was an independent signal of association with CARD9. So this was a genetic variant showing association with expression levels of CARD9, but only in the interferon-stimulated monocytes. So what we then went back to do with Luke Justins was to explore that GWAS data for uh, Crohn's disease. And if you do a conditional analysis, there is actually an independent association, which is right at the borderline in terms of statistical significance that people would typically take in terms of GWAS data. But essentially, this is suggesting we've got two independent associations based on um, expression overlap with GWAS, whereby low expressor alleles are associ associated with disease, reduced disease risk. And it turns out that there, are some, there is at least one rare splice variant uh, 
which is associated with significantly reduced risk. So we can start to build this, this curve whereby we have an insight from the genetics in terms of disease risk. And that gives us a direction of effect in terms of how we might potentially use a therapeutic to either increase or decrease um, a particular target. I wanted to briefly show you this example because I think it illustrates how we can go beyond measuring gene expression and look at other cellular phenotypes. So it was a pleasure to collaborate with James Gilchrist and Adrian Hill, who were doing um, great work in terms of GWAS for a number of infectious diseases. And in this case, they were thinking about non-typhoidal salmonella bacteremia. And we know of a number of Mende rare Mendelian uh, primary amino deficiencies, which are involving um, this process in terms of STAT signaling and gamma interferon. And these are characterized by extreme susceptibility to put what would be normally poorly pathogenic mycobacteria and to non-typhoidal salmonella. So in the GWAS that James and Adrian had done, they'd found an association with a, with a more common variant involved that was located within STAT4, and the hypothesis here was that the association was likely uh, to be involving differential expression. So what was done next was that we recruited um, healthy volunteers by genotype. And we did this through the Oxford Bioresource, which is over 6,000 individuals, which we can recall by genotype. So these are healthy individuals. And we could then look across different cell populations. And we found that specifically in natural killer cells, if we looked at levels of interferon production um, using a fax-based assay, we were able to show that once you had induced the cells, there was association either with IL-2 or with um, non-typhoidal salmonella as a stimulus that was allele-specific. And when James was able to go back and look at data from children in Africa where the original GWAS had been done, it was found that those children that were carrying the risk genotype had reduced serum levels of interferon gamma. So I think we need to really be imaginative in terms of the sort of cellular and other assays that we can use as phenotypes to do this sort of quantitative trait analysis. I'll move on to the second part of the talk now and continue the theme of infection and how we've tried to use genomics to understand our response and what might be different in particular individuals. So sepsis is a condition which is unfortunately very common um, and it's the leading cause of admission to intensive care units in this country and it has a high mortality. Our definitions of sepsis have evolved over time but essentially these are in people who have an infection that in most of us, for example with a pneumonia, we would not go on to develop a systemic dysregulated response to that infection. And it's the host response which is really driving the disease pathology here. And we don't understand why this is happening. So this is our, well, this is the current definition that's been released in terms of sepsis, a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. And it is highly heterogeneous in terms of the underlying organism and um, it may be uh, that the genetics and other factors are contributing to that inter-individual variation. We know that there is both a pro and an anti-inflammatory response happening in these patients. But the hypothesis is whether modulating the septic response with some sort of immunomodulatory therapy might improve survival. So there's been a lot of investment from ph the pharmaceutical industry in this. And unfortunately, despite more than 100 clinical trials of various immunomodulators, including, remember, anti-TNF being first tried in sepsis, there are none that are in current clinical practice. So the first step, perhaps, here is to think about how we can address this heterogeneity. So I was involved in leading with uh, Professor Charles Hines at, at Barts and the London, a study, the UK Genomic Advances in Sepsis Study, whereby we recruited individuals from a number of intensive care units around the UK, and we were able to um, look at gene expression in a total leukocyte population. So I'll show you data now from a, a relatively small discovery cohort, 
And the, here we have some of the, the features of the patients, as you'd expect. Um, the mortality rate is relatively high, about 20% of the patients are unfortunately um, dying at 28 days. And in terms of the infection, we're finding that in about half of cases, we cannot find an underlying organism, which is typical in this scenario. But there's a, a broad spectrum of different underlying bacteria, but all of these patients have pneumonia as the driver of their sepsis. So if we do our transcriptomics, we measure genome-wide gene expression, what, what we did was to do an unstratified hierarchical cluster analysis. In other words, we let the data teach us what the groups might be. So this is just showing you that the tree that arises when you do that sort of analysis for the 10% most variable genes in these peripheral blood white cells. And there are at least two major breaks in the, in the tree. And we're, we're finding, for example, between this group and the remaining patients, a huge number of differentially expressed genes. Over 3,000 genes are differentially expressed. The majority down-regulated in this group. And what we find is that this, this group, which I'm going to refer to as a sepsis response state, is associated with signatures of endotoxin tolerance, T cell exhaustion, and down regulation of HLA class 2. So, a relatively immune suppressed phenotype. And the reason that we pursued this more was that actually there was a very profound difference in mortality when you started to compare these groups. So, this is showing you a Kaplan Meyer plot over time, survival up to 14 days between our two sepsis response state groups. Um, and we found that this was associated with more severe disease, but not with factors such as age, sex, or microbiology. Indeed, if we try to look for any clinical covariate or any conventionally used scoring system for disease severity, such as uh, the SOFA or Apache score, these were not predictive of, our, of the groups. And it didn't appear to be related to the timing with which the sample was taken. And we were able to define the expression of seven genes which were predictive of our endotype group. So in a prospective um, set of patients, we took the expression of those seven genes and used that to define the, the two groups that we were looking at. And in this case, we took equal numbers of survivors and non-survivors. And we looked at mortality. And again, there was a profound difference between our two groups. So the next stage was then to think about, well, if we, if we don't restrict ourselves to pneumonia as the cause of sepsis, but think about other etiologies of sepsis, is this result going to hold? And within the intensive care units, the next most frequent cause of sepsis is what's called fecal peritonitis, whereby bowel contents get into the abdomen and is a massive uh, bacterial challenge. So if we, if we measure gene expression in those patients, and we look at the variation that's present in that data. We can do principal components analysis, which is essentially looking for the major sources of variation in the data. So here I'm showing you the, the principal component one, which accounts for about 20% of the variance, and principal component two, accounting for about 10%. And these circles are either blue or red, depending on whether the patient falls within our sepsis response state one or two. And whether they're filled or unfilled is whether they've got a pneumonia or an abdominal cause for their sepsis. And you can see that the major driver here in terms of the variance is that sepsis response state rather than the underlying etiology. If we look at mortality, again, we see this difference in the peritonitis patients dependent on endotype. And these are uh, receiver under the operating uh, rock curves, whereby we can take predictive gene sets, either from the pneumonia cases or from the peritonitis cases, and actually they, they beha behave well in either group. So what we have now then is a way based on this transcriptomic approach of potentially stratifying our patients. But how could that be useful? Well, the question then is, is it really potentially useful in terms of how we might treat these patients? And this is very recently published data um, in collaboration with Tony Gordon at Imperial College, whereby Tony had done a trial of patients with sepsis called the VANISH trial, whereby they were looking in patients with septic shock, 
and thinking about their response to vasopressor, but also their response to steroids. And it was that steroid response that we were particularly interested in. And because Tony had blood available from the patients, we were able to assign our endotype groups prospectively um, based on our discriminating seven gene signature. So we were able to do that um, as part of a post hoc analysis of this trial. It wasn't part of the original trial design because we didn't know, um, we didn't have knowledge of these endotypes at the time. The first thing to say is that when we looked at 28 day mortality in patients that received the placebo, we saw the same difference in mortality. In other words, our relatively immunosuppressed patients, the SRS1 group, had a higher mortality. But what was very interesting was that although there was no overall effect of steroids across the whole cohort, if we stratify by endotype, we actually see that the patients receiving steroids in our endotype group 2 do considerably worse. So this is arguing that actually we should be thinking about in the context of trials incorporating this sort of transcriptomic-led patient endotyping as a way to potentially reduce some of the heterogeneity and improve our ability to understand um, the, the potential for benefit. Now I realize that we haven't talked about, or I haven't talked about EQTL for a while, so I'll get back to some EQTL for you. Because at the same time as measuring gene expression in all of these patients, we had data on uh, genotyping. So we'd done genome-wide genotyping, and in this case, I'm showing you data for 240 patients. And we were able to map differences in gene expression, and we found a large number of genes showing differential expression based on genotype. About two-thirds of those you would see in a mixed healthy population. But we think in about a third, they're not present in the healthies, and you would expect this based on that data I was showing you for the response to endotoxin. And in some cases, this is accounting for a significant proportion of the variants. So with genes such as IRF5, STAT6, CARD8, over 50% of the variation is dependent on these, the underlying genetics that an individual might have. Now, I mentioned to you about the importance of understanding the chromatin structure and the, the, the sites with which, within which enhancers might lie. And we found that our sepsis EQTL were significantly enriched in histone marks for active enhancer elements, and also sites of open chromatin revealed by DNA's one hypersensitive site mapping. The most significant network that was differentially expressed between those two endotype groups that I showed you involves HIF1-alpha and HIF2-alpha HIF as nodal genes. In other words, it's a hypoxia-related uh, network that, that looks to be particularly different between the endotypes. When you overlay the genetics onto that network, it looks very interesting because many of those genes are showing differential expression dependent on the underlying genotype. So in this case, I'm showing you uh, the data for lactate dehydrogenase A, or LDHA, which is, which is showing very different levels dependent on the particular allele that you've inherited. And this is an EQTL that we're also seeing in our induced monocytes. And this can go to an extreme situation. So this is data for mTOR, which is an absolutely fundamental gene in the switch to pro-inflammatory glycolysis in sepsis. And it's down-regulated in our relatively immunosuppressed SRS1 patients. Now, there's a very strong EQTL, which we can see in these SRS1 patients. And this is a local association plot showing you the individual SNPs and uh, a significant peak of association. When you look in the endotype 2 patients, the association is completely flat. There's no evidence of association. So we're starting to build up increasing numbers of patients now in, a, in order to do the sort of studies that will be able to tell us about whether the genetic drivers of being in a particular endotype group are critical or not. But this sort of data suggests that it may well be the case. Now, if you, if you then think about how you might be using uh, potential therapeutics in the context of these patients, it gets almost impossibly complicated. So there's been interest in, as a therapeutic target, looking at LY96, which binds LPS and TLR4. 
and enables ligand recognition and response. But when you look for the, in terms of the EQTL, remember it, each of these is a different individual. In this case, in, in resting cells, we're seeing an EQTL which switches direction in the presence of um, the endotoxin. So in other words, you might think that, oh, well, we need to particularly target these high-expressing individuals, but actually we could be completely confounded in that. And this is just one example of where there have been trials when it's been looked at the whole, whole sepsis cohort, so not considering particular endotypes, and no association with mortality found. So there's a lot more to do to understand the genetics, but I think at a, at a simpler level, thinking about the particular endotypes, we do have uh, the opportunity to be thinking about how we can stratify the patients to give the right patients the right drug, hopefully at the right time. So in the last part of the talk, I'm going to share with you some unpublished data, how we've really tried to bring together different ways about how we can functionally annotate these genetic variants to really leverage that as much as possible in terms of potential therapeutic targets. And as you'll be well aware, no matter whether we're talking about human populations or animal health, there's a big problem in terms of the drug development pathway with a lack of targets coming through and a very high attrition rate, particularly in late stage clinical trials with, with uh, numbers of drugs up to 85% failing. And there have been a number of studies now which have really driven home the fact that if you have some evidence of genetic support for a target at the outset, that increases your chance of successful progression down that drug development pathway. And the work of Nelson and others, for example, has highlighted that drug targets with genetic support are probably about twice as likely to be therapeutically valid as those without. Now, I've highlighted to you some of the challenges in terms of how we can use uh, data arising from GWAS. The majority of instances whereby genetics has been successfully used to date, the vast majority, have been in the context of Mendelian disease. And I'll show you one example where we have both types of information that are supportive. So this is just briefly an example invo involving the gene uh, encoding sclerostin, which is secreted by uh, osteocytes. And if you look, there are rare loss and gain of function mutations associated respectively with increase or decrease bone mass. And there are GWAS variants for this gene which are associated with differences in mineral density. So that all looks uh, pretty promising. And sclerostin is a negative regulator of bone formation, inhibiting wind signaling. And based on the genetics, you'd hypothesize there could be benefit from reducing SOST activity. And this would be a very different mechanism of action from all current treatments, for example, for osteoporosis. So there have been problems in terms of cardiovascular side effects, but the clinical trials, as I understand it, are now complete, and the FDA has approved an antibody that neutralizes sclerostin. How can we make this a much more general pathway to, to success stories like that? I'm going to show you data uh, arising from the computational brilliance of Hai Fang, a postdoc in my team. And this has been part of an innovative medicines initiative uh, called Ultra DD, or Unrestricted Leveraging of Targets uh, for Research Advancement and Drug Discovery, which is led by the Structural Genomics Consortium in Oxford. So what Hai has done is to think about how we can take GWAS data as, as the input to our, pi our pipeline, and then use genomic predictors to get that question of what's the modulated gene right, or at least are, are, are with the greatest confidence based on the available data. So the first thing that we consider in this pipeline is the genomic proximity of the SNP to a given gene. And the closer our disease-associated SNP is to a particular gene, we'll give a greater weighting to that gene. But what we'll also consider is the pattern of linkage disequilibrium. In other words, the co-inherited variants with that lead SNP, because the lead SNP may not be the functional variant. And we'll also consider the topologically associated domain, in other words, the functional genomic unit within which the variant lies, because it is likely that the modulated gene will be within that functional unit. The second thing we'll consider is evidence of physical interaction, 
So if you remember that looping diagram I showed you with, the, with FTO, so based on chromatin conformation capture, what is the, is the evidence for the region containing the SNP physically interacting with a gene promoter? And here we've used data from Peter Fraser's group at, at, at the Babram Institute, whereby by mapping evidence of physical interaction based on promoter capture high C across a panel of different primary immune cell types, there's a wonderful database that you can then use to do this sort of annotation. The third layer of information is based on EQTL mapping. So I've explained to you how we've generated this in a range of different immune cell types, and we've used data that we've generated within our lab, but also that's publicly accessible or through collaborators to really try and capture the major immune cell populations and, where possible, different conditions of activation. And if you look at some of that um, high C data, for example, there's evidence of physical interaction of this particular SNP with the promoter of these two neighboring genes, and our EQTL data suggests that there is indeed strong association with the expression of these genes in monocytes. So, if a gene has received any, any wedge of the pie based on these um, annotators, based on proximity, physical interaction, or association with gene expression, then it'll continue down this pipeline. If there's no evidence from, that, from those types of annotators, then it won't receive a score. And we're calling these seed genes. And what we want to do next in the pipeline is to take those genes where there's some genetic evidence and say, what else can we annotate them with? So here we start to take advantage of rare disease phenotypes involving immunity, and we will give extra weighting if those immune phenotypes um, are also involving that particular gene. And we can also think about immune function data um, and, based on an ontology-led approach, give additional weighting. And we can then integrate that. And the next part of the pi pipeline is, Im is important because it's not necessarily the GWAS gene itself that is the best drug target, but it might actually be an interacting partner. And indeed, when we looked at drugs that were either in phase two and above or were approved drug targets and just said, well, let's just take the currently reported GWAS genes for that disease, What's the overlap of those reported genes with our approved or in phase two and above targets? And the answer is the overlap is extremely poor, which is a bit disappointing. So here I'm showing you the significance in terms of that um, enrichment. And if you look at the overall data across these different traits, we don't see any enrichment. For a couple of them, such as psoriasis or lupus, there is a modest increase um, enrichment um, in terms of those reported genes. But what about if we take account of the network? What are the interacting partners of those GWAS reported genes? Well, the answer is that the, 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 the picture shifts completely. And so remember, we're, we've gone from negative to a positive odds ratio here. So significant enrichment, whether you're looking at phase two or approved targets, across the vast majority of these different immune traits. So we think it's very important to take account of network connectivity when you're trying to use this type of genetic information. So the next step of High's pipeline incorporates that. And based on a random walk algorithm, we're able to, to use high confidence protein-protein interactions to guide um, where there may be non-genetic seed genes that should be highly prioritized. And this is then all integrated within a predictor matrix, and we get an output for each of the 15,000 genes for a given disease trait that we've put the GWAS data into this, this algorithm. And what this does is that it allows us to identify these potentially really interesting genes that don't have direct genetic evidence. So I'm going to show you a series of slides now which are based on taking the GWAS data for rheumatoid arthritis as our input. And we've used rheumatoid in this example because there are a relatively large number of approved drug targets for human, human disease. TNF being uh, the real prototype in terms of an antibiologic therapy, so anti-TNF has been hugely powerful in terms of rheumatoid treatment. 
but it has no direct genetic evidence. So people have always been very disappointed that it hasn't come up in GWAS. But it's one of these non-seed genes that gets highly prioritized because there are a significant number of genetically prioritized targets that, that are involved in direct interactions with it. So it's ranked 82 out of 15,000 genes, for example. And I'm showing you here some of the other genes with their rating score and their ranking out of 15,000 as the numbers there. If we take the most highly prioritized targets across rheumatoid and we say what are the pathways that are most significantly enriched, what we find is that there's um, perhaps some of the usual suspects that you might expect in terms of T-cell signaling, interferon gamma signaling, PD-1 signaling is interesting. It's come up as a significant side effect now that um, it's being used in anti-cancer therapy, and these patients, unfortunately, some of them are developing um, joint problems. But this is potentially very helpful because there are new, new pathways there that we should be potentially thinking about in terms of targets. If we think about taking all of our highly priority ta prioritized targets and saying, well, is there a network that captures the maximum number of these prioritized targets? Then this is what you see. And I think it's helpful just to highlight to you how for these individual genes, we're ranking them, and these are the types of evidence that we've got. So these are all where we've got colors in these columns are direct genetic annotators. So these are our seed genes. And then in gray are those that are highly prioritized without direct genetic evidence. And this network includes some very topical genes, which are, such as JAK and TIC2 as, as current therapeutic <coughs> targets for rheumatoid. We can use our EQTL data to start to think about direction of effect. So here are some very highly prioritized targets, such as TPN2. And from the EQTL data, the increased disease risk allele is associated with reduced expression in monocytes and CD8 T cells. And that's consistent with an anti-inflammatory role in the myeloid and T reg function, and with PTPN2 being an inhibitor for cancer Im immunotherapy. By contrast with CD40, there's increased um, CD40 expression associated with the risk allele, and that's consistent with high expression in patients with active disease. And there's a lot of interest currently in trying to block um, CD40 to reduce amplification of the T cell response in rheumatoid. So hopefully, in that number of genes where that type of EQTL data is available, it can help guide us about whether an, an agonist or an antagonist should be considered, but significant caveats need to be put to that type of data because I've shown you the complexity in terms of the particular cell types and how it might vary depending on the cell type you're looking at. So if we then think about whether our uh, rheumatoid drug targets either, either that are approved or that are in phase two or above, do we see enrichment for our highly prioritized genes based on this genetic approach? The answer is we do see significant enrichment in both cases. So the an odds, odds ratios of more than 10 um, for these different targets. And we can also do what we're calling a target set enrichment analysis, whereby we consider all of these different prioritized targets. And we see, um, based on a running enrichment score, what we're calling the leading edge, whereby we, we see evidence of prioritization within this leading edge. And we find that three quarters of phase two targets and above are within that set. So currently, all, all biologic therapies that are in use in rheumatoid are captured within this leading edge. And we've got variable degrees of evidence to support that, but I think it, it's, a, it's a promising start. If we think about mouse arthritis phenotypes and the enrichment that we might see with our um, genetic-led prioritization, we see significant enrichment, and this includes validated models of autoimmune arthritis with highly prioritized genes based on the human genetics for IL-6, ST, and ZAP-70. Now, it would be nice to have some experimental evidence otherwise to, to try and support this genetic prioritization. I'm work it, working with colleagues in Janssen who'd done a compound screen completely independently what we were able to do was to say, what's the transcriptional response to that array of different compounds? How does it relate to the pattern of gene expression we see in patients? 
And let's give a score for the compounds that are producing a transcriptional response that would be consistent with the differences we see in patients. So this is the score that's plotted on the y-axis here. And if we then use that compound-derived score and relate it to our genetic prioritization score, we see a reasonably significant correlation, which is, which is good to see. But it's only one part of the sort of validation that we really want to start to build up. I want to briefly show you how we haven't just looked at rheumatoid. We've now applied this across a broad range of immune traits. And I'm showing you 16 different traits here where there are at least 10 approved targets that we can use as some sort of validation. And we can think about our target set enrichment. And we see enrichment across all of these traits, um, apart from primary biliary cirrhosis. And this is another way to show you the data. So this is the normalized enrichment score and the significance, and there's a whole series of traits which you might expect, such as ulcerative colitis, ankylosing spondylitis, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, where the genetics does pretty well at identifying these, uh, these known targets. And because we've got this information across different traits, we can start to say, well, in terms of drug targets, what does the therapeutic landscape look like? So in other words, the closer that traits are on this plot, the more similar they are in terms of their highly prioritized targets, and you've got particular traits clustering together, such as ankylosing spondylitis with inflammatory bowel disease and psoriasis. And then how high up the mountain is how high the genetics is doing in terms of being predictive for these targets. We can think about this at the pathway level, and I'll just show you a couple of examples within the, within the immune system of how highly prioritized uh, nodes in these pathways, such as multiple sclerosis, we get very significant enrichment for type 1 and type 2 interferons. And if we then look at a random mutagenesis screen that's been done for regulators of the interferon response factor 1 involved in that interferon response, we find that the mutation index, the activity of those regulators, correlates very well with our PI rating in, in multiple sclerosis. So this is indirect evidence uh, supporting the rating. And similarly, in the context of allergy, we see a lot of toll-like receptors coming up as being highly prioritized. And here, there's a genome-wide CRISPR screen that had been published where we could take the data. And again, we saw a correlation um, for positive regulators, in this case, of TLR4, and our PI rating in allergy. The final uh, bit of experimental evidence that I just wanted to briefly share with you is data that's arisen from the Karolinska Institute as part of this collaboration uh, through L Louise Berg. And essentially what Louise and colleagues did was to take a set of epigenetic inhibitors which target almost all of the members of the epigenetic family. And this was done in the context of lupus patients. So these are cells from lupus patients where we were looking at, immu looking at immunoglobulin levels in response to the epigenetic inhibitor. And again, we saw a, a a relationship between the ranking that came from that epigenetic inhibitor screen and our PI rating in lupus. Finally, we can take all of the data for across these different immune traits and say, what are the pathways that come up as, as being very highly rated? And the answer is TNF signaling and JAK-STAT signaling. And that's perhaps not a surprise. But when you start to look at the networks, there are members of the networks that could be very interesting as, as potential therapeutics targets. So I'll end at that point. Um, and as I'm aware that we, we definitely don't want to overrun into lunch and getting away to the airport, but I hope that I've shown you how genetic drivers of the immune response transcriptome, including common alleles, can have important consequences for gene function and for disease risk. And how in the context of that dysregulated response to infection that I was showing you in sepsis, a genetics-led stratified medicine approach may be feasible and give us new opportunities for targeted therapy. But I think a, a recurrent theme of the talk has been how, how can we really maximally use GWAS information? And I hope that the approach that I've shared with you where we can try to annotate better the results of the GWAS, take account of network connectivity, can hopefully really help us in that process of identifying drug targets. And clearly, as the new data sets start to come through, that process should only improve. I've highlighted a number of people as I've gone along, but in particular, I'd just like to acknowledge again the key roles played by Hai Fang, 
by Katie Burnham, and by Emma Davenport and Ben Fairfax in the generation of much of the data I've shown you, together with the GAINS investigators and members of the Ultra DD Consortium. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot for a lovely talk. So we have time for some questions. Thank you for that, most impressive. Um, in the very beginning, you were talking about the fact that there's an effect of stimulating the cells as to whether you see the EQTLs. Yeah. And so that implies that there's two states of the cell that you've looked at. Yep. How many different states do you think there might be for any particular cell, and will they be discrete? I think that's a great question because it, you know, it, it becomes an, almost an impossible challenge to be looking at the full gamut of possible states that the cells could be in the t and time courses. Um, I think that as we start to generate more and more of these data sets, there will be increasing overlap with, with genetic variants involved in key nodes or components of pathways that will show commonality across cell types, perhaps, and different conditions of activation. But because we're scratching the surface at the moment, I don't know what the answer is. But, but lots of people are generating these types of data sets, so it'll be very interesting to see. It could be very interesting to look at a kind of a state model of cells. Yes, yes. So it was very informative that you were able to identify through GWAS particular regions and then started looking for EQTLs, but you were confining your search to the leukocytes and peripheral blood monocytes. Yeah. How confident are, are you that your EQTLs are not correlated instead of causative? Because you're looking at one compartment, but that one compartment could be re responding to yes. change in brain signaling that, that is... Yes. And, and so it, it seems to be a very murky mess that you could get into and chasing a lot of wild geese, just as an animal genetics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I think in a way that trans-EQTL analysis shows you how you could be focusing on a particular gene, but it's a, con it's a downstream consequence. Um, and so... Again, I think that we, we need those, those additional data sets. I think that GTEC, whereby you know, there's 40-plus there's different tissues where we've got available it's post, rapid post-mortem tissue, because otherwise the tissues are inaccessible. But that will start to teach us something about the, you know, the full spectrum of tissue and cellular states. Um, but it also brings home the fact that EQTL are only one part of being able to dissect this kind of problem. And I think you really need greater information on that functional genomic landscape, the epigenetic processes that are happening, and to keep an open mind that you may be, f may be chasing a goose and you know, what, use biology to teach you where else you should be looking. Um, just trying to, uh, uh, thinking about the complexity of everything yeah. um, and the future machine learning approaches and things yeah. I'm sure that you're thinking about, but how, does, how much data do you need? So, if we went into a different ethnic population yep. or a different breed, you know, the high C data in particular can be quite different from a different, different ethnic group. Yep. So at what point do you think there's enough data to start making inferences? I mean, we, I think we can start making inferences now. I mean, we, we, they have to be caveated inferences, but um, there's, a, there's a major issue in general in terms of human health with the fact that GWAS have been predominantly in Caucasian populations. There's increasing populations now from the Far East particularly, but also um, they will start coming through from African populations. And when, for example, people have done these type of EQTL studies comparing African and, U and um, European populations, we do see differences, as, you, as you'd expect, but not, not, a, not a huge number. So I think that there'll be broad lessons we can learn, and we should start acting on the information because I haven't shown you perfect validation, particularly for that, that type of, of drug prioritization work, where really we need to start saying, well, let, let's, let's believe the genetics, let's take, let's take a target and really push it through the whole process. But that's going to take years of work to do. So let's build these other data sets, but start. Okay, I think the last question. Julian, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, my, my question relates to, you know, your phenotype or your, your disease, yeah. the, 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 the classification and sub, sub, you know, they are 
different types of disease within one. Yep. And that's where I think, uh, from, from the animal perspective, we haven't uh, progressed enough because you know, what we're looking at is a confounded situation where we lose any genetic yep. analysis. So how can you, you know, give advice on how to move forward on that? Well, the only advice I could give, and I, haven't, I didn't have time to show you the data, was that that UK genomic advances in study, with, study was set up to do a GWAS in sepsis. And I, I convinced the, 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 the team that we should be collecting the cells to do the sort of functional genomic work as well. But that original GWAS had one hit. And I think that we need to now repeat that, taking account of the endotypes we've defined, and I think we'll find a lot more hits. So you, you need to get that right, because otherwise it's a big investment of time and effort. And if your phenotype isn't clear, the genetics won't pan out. So it, it's a take-home message here that it's in the, the merit of GIVA studies, not so much to find the cause of variance, but more to understand the network of interacting genes in a disease. Yeah, I think that is also a broad, a, a, yeah, I broadly agree with that, definitely. Yeah. Okay, I think we need to stop there and thank Julian again for a lovely talk. Thank you.